Welcome to For the Love of Books, a podcast by North Lancashire Libraries. Hi everyone, welcome back to the North Lancashire Libraries podcast for the love of books. My name is Chris Wilson, the e-services librarian, and today is National Poetry Day and we're also in the midst of Libraries Week. And because it's National Poetry Day, we decided to do something a little bit special with today's episode. If you have listened to the podcast previously, you may have heard that we did run a National Poetry Day competition and that ebook that we that was the prize for that has went live on our ebook service today. But we are going to do something a little bit special with this episode of the podcast because we're also going to do an audiobook of sorts for the winning entries. So I have managed to get a library staff member to read each of the winning poems and we're going to list them and play them in this episode of the podcast. So listen up and enjoy all the readings as they come. Our first reading is by Judy from Airdrie Library. The Baldernock Churchyard Fairies by James D.G. Beatty. Lost of hope in deepest dark, perchance upon an eldritch light that blazes wildly in the night, coruscating hallowed green. And in the midst of deepest dark, a vision flits from left to right, grand, sublime, a wondrous sight. This surely is a queen. And stepping forth on hallowed green, betwixt the stones to join his queen, a king in all his splendid form, cuts low and takes a bow. Then hand in hand, they arch and spin to join as one in perfect scene, a fairy king and fairy queen, anointing sacred bow. And watching, silent by the walls, where pious men seek grace, an old and fading maple tree holds stalwart more or less, Two centuries of tapered roots that peak in every space that pry among the ancient crypts to meet incumbent guests. Still on they spin in violent haze and sweep towards the gate, setting weary sunken slabs a fiery glow. Fierce hues play o'er the watchtower circa 1828. Scorched rings around the hero's cross of Tinto, Stroud and Co. With passion spent, entwined, content, they waft across the lee, disappearing far beyond the thoughts of men. A fabled pair no mortal eyes will ever chance to see till they return to bind their vows again. Next, we have Susan from New Mains Library. It's Only a Hedgehog by Craig Blades. It was silent and dark in the dead of the night, as I tried very hard not to give it a fright. I could just make it out as it stood very still under the hedge at the top of the hill. It moved ever so slightly as not to make any sound, carefully missing the dried leaves that lay thick on the ground. Like a flutter of snow on a cold winter's night, it just glided along until it disappeared out of sight. Suddenly it scuttered to the edge of the hedge, where I had left the dried fruit on the little grass verge. It sniffed and it wandered around for a while, and then placed some of the fruit in a very small pile. Checking to make sure there was no one around, it buried the small pile of fruit under the ground. I'm guessing he'll come back for it later tonight, when he knows that there's definitely no one in sight. It wandered away under the leaves and the bark, where it will hide for a while until the evening becomes dark. They're very timid and harmless and can sometimes be bright. Hedgehogs are strange little creatures that only come out when it's night. Up next is Peter from Motherwell Library. Trust 
Tragedy by L. G. Bryant Clouds and clouds of it fogging my brain Nights and nights of it image of me slain Hero or villain undecided it remain Memories I wish I was ill in the ghastly unwashable stain Owner of the dagger is not who you'd expect No Macbeth-like swagger cause this blood specked If you dare to know the evil of her crime A mirror to the body show The killer's hands were mine The next poem is read by Craig our Macmillan project manager. Montague Masked by Erin Corley O oh, happy dagger of this deceit, of this lust and misdeed, intoxicated with the smell of rebellion, the taste of intimacy, the belief of attachment, I am free of love tonight. Struck by the sight of my body, a denseness consumed the air, as the boy who I was to love succumbed to untimely frost, acquitting me from his cage of passion. It wasn't an unhappy marriage. Could a marriage be happy? Standing on the shaky ground of adultery, we were drawn to each other like magnets. Yet not all magnets can stick together. Negatives outweigh positives and true colours are always shown. He took my childhood and made me his own idealistic lover. My compliance forever altered. I willingly sold myself, all because of the moon. The boy who was sick with grief, who promised fidelity to a comet, has lain in the bed that he so made, gullibility, blindness, lunacy, for love does not conquer all. Parting is such sweet sorrow no more, I am released from the shadow that clung to me like garment, for if I am the sun, I must be allowed to shine in my own reflection. My love for life overflows. This whirlwind of emotive events have given me a free pass to freedom, a new beginning to outgrow restraints of misogyny where mutiny is no longer. Let this be my sheath, my protection and my promise. And Juliet becomes once more Capulet. Our next reading comes from Hilary from Mother Library. Lockdown by Elizabeth Clark. In the time of Covid, my story was your story, everybody's story. Instead of flowers or cards, we said it with applause on Thursday doorsteps waving self-consciously to our now distant neighbours. Some buying saucepans, recent receptacles of soup kitchen broth, meant for others, too afraid to accept. Masks concealed smiles and hugs became virtual, as the most vulnerable with already confused thoughts stared baffled through remote connecting glass. The pub, cafe, gym and bingo hall lay dark and deserted, while screens lit up with the awkward images of online pen pals. We rolled up our sleeves for others and learned a new way of caring. Next to read is Catherine from Wishow Library. The Lonely Shore by Stephen Gallagher Perched in my boat by the lonely shore My final thoughts 
are with these old wooden oars. Half crescent moon, warm gentle breeze, can I hear nature's hymn or a whisper from the sea? My time has now come for my restless soul to fly and become someone's memory and tears that they cry. Our next reader is Russell, our library service manager. The River by David Harper The wondrous, infinite river, wild amongst all things, allows safe passage to those willing to still their hearts and match the constant pounding of the waves. The tools to build a crossing lies unguarded, close to hand, and free to infuse with all natural hope, shaking them from slumber and starting them to life. Unkind are the river's depths, where demons and temptresses wade. They blaze a discording yet mesmerising song, revealing fantastical treasures, if only you would plunge. The river's clutch is mighty, where the warmth of the sun, fast becoming fever dream, can seem an unreasonable and unfulfilling quest. But quest it we must, for if we mingle in that untamed black vastness, it will silent rend the very skin from our souls. And so we brave the river, above it, watchful, safe, in the presence of other keen adventurers who combine and match its awesome strength, only with each other. Next poem has been read by Jean from Wishaw Library. Scottish Sunshine Summer has turned to winter. I've got the heating on in July. It's so cold, been raining all day. No sun in our cloudy sky. Billy says there's no bad weather. It's only the wrong clothes you wear. But life's not a peach when you're on the beach and you've got on four layers. Eskimo's got 50 words for snow. We've got more for rain. Don't need to worry about sunburn when summer goes down the drain. No wonder we all head abroad in search of Scotchy O when it's Baltic here in mid-July and it's 15 degrees below. We live in a wonderful country with mountains, lochs and glens where tourists look up to the sky and wonder where the sun has went. Wouldn't want to live anywhere else, nowhere I'd rather be, but I'd like a wee bit more of those solar rays for a boost of vitamin D. Up next is Andrew from Coatbridge Library. The Castle Carey Horseman by Albert McBeath. Old folk tales and legend has it that when darkness falls and the moon is high, a shadowy horse and rider appears around the village of Castle Carey. Some hear the clatter of hooves on cobbles, while others the thunder of a gallop through the fields and glen. People say he's a Roman sentry who gave an oath to Antoninus to eternally guard his mighty wall and fort. He's been saluting the lost Roman legion as they marched off to battle, or perhaps it was to the last of the garrison as back to Rome they fled. Others say it's a kilted Jacobite with sword and shield in hand, searching for his bonny prince to serve forevermore by his side. Sometimes he sits by a glowing campfire, quietly whispering long forgotten songs as his horse stands in the shadows, resting from their eternal search. Some people say the rider's a lady with long red flowing hair, searching for her child 
lost out on the cold and lonely moor. You can hear her gently sobbing and calling out for William, while a flickering lantern casts haunting shadows through the darkness of the night. Once I heard it's a girl called Kirsty with a message for her signalman dad to warn him of the impending storms raging across the sea and land. Barefooted in a white flowing gown with a black whip in her hand, riding bareback in a canter along the railway track. I can't say for sure I've seen it myself, but I have heard the horse's hooves. It stopped outside my window as I trembled and held my breath. After the horse had moved along, I took a look outside. I saw horse steps in the snow, and far out in the distance, a horse and rider's ghostly glow. Our next reader is Gillian from the Voltier NLT. My Class by Anne McGonnell I can smell the chalk dust, see the worn wooden floor, the bright round silver handle on her classroom door. Mrs Grant really cared for all her girls and boys, gave us that teacher stare to stop us making noise. She never had favourites, tacked her best work on the wall. She once put on a pantomime. We all had a ball. The boys were dressed in tutus with rednecks all around. We were in hysterics as they thundered up and down. Warmer frozen milk in cartons was our fate. The jammy brought it in a bright orange plastic crate. One day our classmate Stevie gave us all a fright, kicked his football way up high broke the classroom light. So he ran off home, afraid he was in trouble. Mrs Grant found out and followed at the double. It'll be our secret, she said as she returned. It was just an accident and no harm was done. She was a special teacher, taught us all so much. English, maths and friendship, laughter, values and trust. Next to read the poem is Alison from Coatbridge Library. Morgan Glen by Rose McGregor. Tarry with me a while in Broomhill's path, where the once seafaring Captain McNeil Hamilton's footprints treaded. Keep a weather eye on the leaching of the iron ore trickling under your feet whilst we clamber aboard nature's galleon ship to the song of the even waters. Step up, step up. The further you climb, we will be able to espy from the nest of the crows the sinking of the saffron sun as her bronzed kisses smother nature's hairline dressed with the ribbons of autumn. Stand aloft in your sperries upon the spag moss. Smell the musty, pungent air as mother nature's trunk journeys the Avon with the ochre foam. Following the mirrored sparkles that dance and swim towards the blue Millhue Bridge, Behold the Bay of Pebbles, where rank and file skim stones upon the pool of still waters, as lunch and guests rubberneck from the hilltop view of the Apple Bank Inn. For taste forest fruits from the captain's table, the berry bush of blackberries, copious chestnuts and remedial rose hips, all laced with green ivy, all clustered together with her black raven fruits, as the aroma of the elderflower beckons you to sip her liquor. Trample homewards intoxicated through the wooded gorge of Morgan Glen, Rebuff Rose Bay Willow as she beckons you to stay within the breeze of the oak and the ash. For she is the weed of fire who will blind you with the puff of her seed if you dare to look upon her long enough. Descend down the breeze of the hundred steps after approaching the Broomhill Viaduct. Follow your own path home carefully. Watch your step. Take a peek over your shoulder just in case the black lady of Broomhill House escorted you home. For if she has, she may not want to leave because her house, Broomhill House, the captain's house, lies in ruins within the grounds of Morgan Glen. He left with death. She stayed in spirit. Also from Coatbridge Library, our next reader is Thomas. The Isle of Skye 
The largest of the inner Hebridean isles, striking and moody, with the Killen Range in the background, rugged and broody. A landscape for adventures just waiting to be found, where the old man of star stuck his thumb out the ground. Where the fairy pools plow, and the clouds made in stone proud, and the wind at Neast Point Lighthouse blows fierce and blows loud. There's the scorry breek loop with broad views of the sea, out to the island of Rassi, for the bay of Portree. We've done Bagan, Olsen Broadford, Oog and Staffin. If you're looking for good scenery, you're mere than just laughing. It's a place of raw beauty on Scotland's northwestern coast. Another jewel in our crown, another reason to boast. Next to read is a Catherine from Cumbernauld Library. The Falling Man by Mick Nail Stepping off into the sky No chance to call to say goodbye One final act, no time to plan And so becomes the falling man by stepping off, by letting go, a chance for all the world to know his final choice. By his own hand, the courage of the falling man. No need to know from where he came, no envy of his growing fame. His image speaks as no voice can, forever as the falling man. Final poem has been read by Phyllis from Cumbernauld Library. Haggis, a rare creature native to Scotland, never seen, never heard, never befriended, until now. I was walking through my woods with nowhere left to find, my trees surrounding all of me. The branches and I entwined. Not a care in the world, not thinking, nothing on my mind. When all of a sudden, and with great surprise, I heard a gruff noise from behind. Now I knew all my wildlife by sight, by smell, by sound. But this was a new unknown as I slowly turned around. And there before me, in the shadow of my old oak on the ground, sat a strange and scraggy creature with a pink face fully frowned. Its eyes were round, brown, big and bold, with a stub nose in between, and ears located either side of its head that could only just be seen. Black hair covered everywhere, apart from its full pink face, and four short legs on its underneath that would never win a race. Its legs, while short, looked very strong and were ended with massive paws and protruding from each paw times four were Kodiak bear-like claws. It gruffed again, which displayed its teeth and a tongue as pink as pigs. Was this the elusive never-before-seen, the magical, mythical haggis? Now, a haggis is often confused with that dish the Scottish eat. Some say it's a delight with mashed potatoes and a turnip called a neat. But this was something different, something truly real. This was breathing and had a beating heart, an existence that I could feel. Anyway, it wasn't very big, just a few feet, head to toe, and I wasn't sure if it was an adult or still had a bit to grow. Its teeth looked adult enough as it continued to gruff away. This was turning into a somewhat not to be forgotten day. I remained motionless, apart from one blink and the occasional nose twitch, the result of catching a slight cold which had left an annoying nasal itch. The haggis mimicked my immobility and didn't prompt a move. I then wondered if my next action would cause it to disapprove. My next action, yes, this would be crucial, I thought. The importance of good first impressions I had always, always been taught. 
stand up straight, be polite, or mayhem will ensue. I tipped my invisible hat, smiled and said, How do you do you do? The haggis appeared confused as it looked at my hatless hand, gave another gruff, then proceeded on all fours to stand. It then moved its clawed paw upwards and copied what I had done. Then six more eyes, six ears, three noses. This was not the only one. And there we have it. That is the end of the poetry collection that was put together, especially for National Poetry Day. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. And do check out the ebook as well, which is now available on Borrowbox to download and read through as well. So you can catch out the words as well on there too. This has been a special edition of the podcast for National Poetry Day. And we hope that everyone has enjoyed listening to it and do, does, has had a fantastic National Poetry Day. Don't forget, you can leave us some feedback on our, pod, our podcast using hashtag FLB podcast or by dropping us an email to librarypodcast at northland.gov.uk. But we'll be back again soon with more episodes of the podcast and we will see you then. Bye for now.